Walburga Ersterreich, known as Dolly to her friends and family, was originally Walburga Korchel before she got married. Her exact birthday is unknown, but we do know she was born in 1880. Her parents were German immigrants to the United States, but it's unclear if she was born in Germany or after her parents moved to the USA. Dolly grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, surrounded by many German immigrant neighbors, and she was raised in a German community. Her family faced financial struggles, so she started working at a textile mill owned by Fred Ersterreich when she was 12 years old. Though we don't have much information about her life with her family, we do know that she was a charismatic, sweet, and charming girl. She was very outspoken, and it didn't take long for her to make friends. She was quite well-liked. At the textile mill where she worked, and this was where she caught the attention of Fred Ersterreich. Soon Fred and Dolly got to know one another and they began courting soon after. Fred, who was 17 at the time, would often meet Dolly, who was 12. Their young love blossomed, and when Dolly turned 17, the two of them got married. In 1898, both Dolly and Fred found themselves in a rather good position. Fred was managing his family's business while Dolly helped Fred. They were happily married. When he entered his 20s, Fred became a very successful man as he began to open a number of other businesses apart from his family's textile mill. One of those successful businesses that he owned was an apron factory. Dolly, who as a child faced financial troubles, now had no problems at all. She was now able to afford a better lifestyle than she was previously living. But though her husband Fred was bringing home good money, this also meant that he had to work long hours. Fred began working late hours to run his multiple businesses while Dolly stayed at home and took care of their household needs. Things had been going well for the couple for some time, but eventually problems started to emerge. Now Dolly, like any person, had needs. She wanted her husband's love and attention, but Fred was a busy man. He couldn't give Dolly what she wanted because he was often working too late, and when he was home he often spent his time getting drunk and gave no time to Dolly. This left Dolly feeling unhappy and unsatisfied with their marriage. Dolly wanted to fill the void caused by her marriage and began having affairs with a number of men to do so. Fred was too preoccupied with his work and his business to even notice. Dolly, who was now a 33-year-old woman, was rumored to have had a number of lovers besides Fred up till this point. Needless to say, Fred, who was usually at one of his factories, was always too drunk or too busy to attend to Dolly. The couple did have a son at one point, but he passed away at a young age which only compounded the loneliness Dolly was experiencing. On a warm autumn day in 1913, Dolly was alone at home. Her husband Fred was at work. She called her husband at the apron factory, complaining that her sewing machine did not work. Otto Sandhuber, who was 17, and the sewing machine repairman at the factory was sent by her spouse to fix it. Dolly Ersterreich had spotted him at her husband's workplace and knew that he would be the one to come. The doorbell rang and Dolly, who had now changed into nothing but a robe and stockings, answered it. In came Otto Sandhuber, a naive 17-year-old boy and he was immediately bewitched by Dolly. They both began their long-winded affair that day, but little did they know the lengths it would go to. After this, Dolly and Otto would initially meet up and go to different hotels together so that no one would notice them. They were cautious because they didn't want Fred to know about their affair. This went on for a couple of months, but Dolly got tired of it. Her main concern was that hotels cost money, Fred's money. She didn't want Fred to realize that his money was going missing and find out that Dolly was going to hotels with someone who was working at his factory. So she suggested that their sexual relationship could be continued at her house. Now Otto would come to the house whenever Dolly wanted. Now that Dolly wasn't going to hotels anymore and Otto would often come over, she thought the problem was resolved. But there was one thing she didn't take into account. Otto was coming over so often that the neighbors started to notice. One day a neighbor asked her who this man was, who was coming to her house so often. And to this she replied that he was her half-brother. She told her neighbor that he was a vagabond and that was the reason he was coming around all the time. The neighbor believed her and they got away with it. But then she began to worry about what would happen if Fred found out. She didn't want to go back to going to hotels, because that would mean she had to spend Fred's money. This time, Dolly came up with an even more twisted plan. 
Otto was to move into Dolly's attic. He would resign from his position at the factory and sever all ties to the outside world. Dolly would provide him with food and water, and whenever Fred was away at work, they could be together. When you think about it, this does seem extreme. However, from Otto's perspective, this meant the world to him. Now Otto had neither family nor friends to ask for permission for such a request. So he obliged. To him, this meant that he didn't have to work anymore. He didn't have to pay for shelter or food. And to top it all off, he would get to be with Dolly. It is also important to mention that Otto wanted to be a pop fiction writer at the time. With so much free time, he could practice writing his novels. And this was a big reason that he thought this offer was so good for him. When Otto agreed to her request, Dolly was overjoyed. She got him situated in the attic, which was right above the bedroom she shared with her husband. It was accessible through a panel in the ceiling of the bedroom's closet. She put in a bed and a desk so that he could write his novels. She would also bring him books from the library every week. Along with that, she would never forget to bring him food every day. At night Otto would read mysteries by candlelight and write stories about love, lust, and adventure. He would work on writing pulp fiction and hope to get his work published someday. By day he would make love to Dolly and help her around the house. No one knew about the man in the attic. Fred was also unaware of the fact that there was a man in his house, staying right above his bedroom. This bizarre routine went on. For five long years, Fred Ersterreich was a busy man, but that didn't keep him from noticing odd things that were happening around his house. Fred noticed that while he was away, their food was finishing sooner than it should have been. His cigars would run out, and when Dolly wasn't in the bedroom, he'd sometimes hear noises coming from above. Fred would constantly ask Dolly if she too heard anything peculiar in the house, but she would always insist that there was nothing going on. These strange occurrences made him think that he was going crazy. So Dolly advised him to consult with a doctor. Fred then booked an appointment with the doctor. But to his surprise, the doctor said there was nothing wrong with him. Dolly then justified it saying that maybe he was too stressed out with work, or it could be because he got drunk too often. In the meantime, Fred had opened a new factory in Los Angeles and he decided that maybe they should relocate. That way, he could leave the strange and disturbing occurrences behind. In 1917, both Dolly and Fred went to LA to find themselves a new home. But it took them longer than expected because Dolly wanted a house with an attic. However, the problem was that the houses in LA at the time didn't usually have them. Despite that, Fred managed to find a house with an attic on Sunset Boulevard. Dolly was immensely happy with the house because it was in a beautiful location, but most importantly, had an attic. They then went back to Milwaukee and prepared for the move. During this time, Dolly made sure to send Otto to LA before they moved, so that he could get situated in the attic prior to their arrival. Otto agreed and he moved to LA at Dolly's request. As Fred and Dolly got comfortable in their new house in LA, life continued as it had back in Milwaukee. Otto was doing great. He had managed to publish a few of his stories under another name and earn some money. He was now writing a novel during his time in the attic. With the money that he had gotten, he helped Dolly with some of his expenses at their new home. Meanwhile, Fred started to get paranoid. He claimed that the noises that he had heard in the house in Milwaukee had followed him to LA. Fred soon started working long hours once again and started drinking even more. As the months passed, his relationship with Dolly started to turn sour, and they began to fight a lot. By 1922, Fred and Dolly's fights had become constant. On August 22nd of that year, Fred and Dolly had their biggest fight yet, and Otto, who was in the attic at the time, heard it. To him, it sounded like Fred wanted to hurt Dolly, and Otto felt he had to do something to protect her. He crawled down through the small hole that exited into Dolly and Fred's bedroom. He then found two 25 caliber pistols that were on the table, and ran towards Fred and Dolly. When Fred saw Otto, he immediately recognized him, since he used to work for Fred at the apron factory. Fred couldn't believe that the noises he had heard from the ceiling were actually because Otto had been living there. In a split second, he realized that his wife had been lying to him and had been having an affair behind his back for 10 long years. Fred and Otto then got into a fight. 
In the ensuing struggle, three times in the chest and Fred died instantly. This was when both Dolly and Otto started to panic. They then came up with a plan for Otto to lock Dolly in a closet from the outside and take the key and the guns with him to the attic along with all the cash in the house and Fred's expensive diamond watch. They knew the neighbors would report the gunshots and this way Dolly would have an alibi and it would look like this had been a robbery gone wrong. When the Los Angeles police showed up at the large house located at 858 North Andrews Boulevard, the scene they found was the man of the house, rich businessman Fred Ersterreich lying on the floor shot dead. His wife Dolly Ersterreich was locked in a closet. When they let her out she frantically cried and said that a strange man had broken into their home and robbed them. However, on investigating the scene the police found only the husband's watch and some cash missing, with plenty of other valuable items still in the house. Something about the crime didn't seem quite right, but on the surface they accepted the story of a burglary gone wrong. Dolly was a suspect in the murder of Fred Ersterreich, but the police couldn't understand one thing. How could she have locked herself in the closet if she was the one who killed him? With no further evidence, they soon dropped the charges against her, and she was in the clear. She even held a funeral for Fred and soon inherited the millions that belonged to her husband. Dolly was now a rich widow. Not only was she rich in terms of wealth, she was also rich in love. Her lover Otto Sandhuber could now live out in the open with her. The two of them soon relocated to a new home which also happened to have an attic. But here was the twist. Since Fred was now gone, Dolly could have Otto live out in the open with her, but instead he continued to live in her attic. Otto continued writing Pulp Fiction, and with the money he earned from his published articles, he was allowed to purchase a typewriter, since there was no one there to hear it now. Meanwhile, not long after this, Dolly managed to get herself a new lover. This time, it was her own lawyer, the same lawyer who defended her when she was a suspect in Fred's murder, and had helped handle Fred's estate after his death. His name was Herman Shapiro, a successful lawyer and an eligible bachelor. When Dolly saw him, she fell in love with him instantly. She was so smitten by him that she made her first mistake. One day she decided to give Herman a gift, a diamond watch. But the problem was, this was the same watch as the one that was allegedly stolen the night that Fred was killed. It didn't take long for Herman to notice this, as he was aware of the missing watch as her lawyer. He asked Dolly about this. To cover for herself, she told him that she later realized the watch hadn't actually been stolen, as she had found it under a window seat cushion sometime after the night her husband died. Herman had his doubts, but he loved Dolly, so he remained silent. Herman, who was a big-time lawyer, went back to working long hours, and this left Dolly unsatisfied. Even with Otto in the attic, she decided to go out and find another lover. The next man she approached was Roy Klum. Now, Roy was an aspiring actor and a businessman and had a flashy lifestyle which attracted her. He too became very interested in Dolly. Soon after, the two started having a sexual relationship. For Dolly, Roy kept her occupied while Herman was busy with work. And when Roy wasn't available, she would be with Herman. And if neither was around, Otto was always there in the attic still infatuated with her. As time went by, Roy started to get extremely fond of Dolly, which is why when Dolly asked him to do something suspicious, he did it without question. She persuaded him to ditch a gun for her, saying it resembled the burglar's gun that had killed her husband, and she didn't want to get in trouble. Roy agreed and tossed this gun in the La Brea tar pits. Once the job was done, Dolly felt like she could breathe a little easier without having to look over her shoulder. However, there was still the second gun in her possession. To deal with this, she approached her neighbor and sweet-talked him into burying the other gun in his backyard, telling him the same story she told Roy. Dolly was quite a sweet-talker, and he agreed to her request and buried the pistol under a rose bush in his garden. Now that the two crucial pieces of evidence that killed Fred Ersterreich were done with, Dolly finally felt free, but she did not know that the worst was waiting for her. Almost a year went by and no one knew who had killed Fred Ersterreich on the night of August 22, 1922. However, by July of the next year, a detective received a tip that Herman was wearing a watch that looked exactly like Fred's. This excited the police and the case of Fred's shooting soon became an active investigation. 
the detectives wanted to take this piece of information and connect it to the missing pieces of the puzzle. To their surprise, they found out it was none other than Dolly who had given him the watch. In the statement when Fred's body was found, she said that a robber had stolen all of Fred's personal and valuable belongings, which included the diamond watch that was currently on Herman's wrist. This now made Dolly the prime suspect in the murder. This was coincidentally also the time when Dolly decided that she no longer needed Roy Klom, perhaps because she had got what she wanted after using him to dispose of the gun. However, Roy was not happy with this. In fact, he was so upset that he went to the police with the story and told them all about the gun that Dolly gave him and what he did with it. The next day when the headlines hit the papers, her neighbor also walked into the police station with the second gun. Here, he confessed that she had given him yet another pistol shortly after the murder, asking him to dispose of it because it too closely resembled the gun that killed her husband. And she did not want to get into trouble. The case became a hot topic and soon the police had recovered the pistols from both locations. However, they were badly decayed. Despite this, the police were able to determine that the two were of the same caliber as the gun which murdered Dolly's husband, Fred Ersterreich, but both were too rusted to determine whether they had fired the fatal bullets. Dolly was subsequently detained by the authorities under suspicion of murder. While Dolly was detained, she realized that Otto was still in the attic and no one was home. Fearing for Otto's well-being, she confided in Herman and told him that her vagabond stepbrother was living in the attic of her home and requested him to check on his well-being. Herman was puzzled when he heard this. He went straight to her house, and when he knocked on the trapdoor leading to the attic, a thin, pale man answered. This was when Herman finally met Otto Sandhuber, Dolly's attic lover. When Herman and Otto Otto wasn't Dolly's stepbrother, Rather, he was a part of her life before she even settled in her L.A. home. Herman was completely baffled when he found out the truth that the person who lived in Dolly's attic was actually the person who killed Fred Ersterreich. He was the person whom the police were looking for, and all this time he had been living in Dolly's attic. What shocked him even more was that he learned that Dolly and Otto were romantically and physically involved with each other. This angered Herman, but he was still fixated on Dolly. He could have handed Otto over to the police, but instead he told him to leave the area right away. Otto, on hearing that Dolly was in jail and that he might soon become a suspect, finally left his hideaway without putting up a fight. He moved to Canada, changed his name to Walter Klein, and started living a new life. Dolly, on the other hand, did not serve prison time as the police could not prove that she was involved in the murder of Fred Ersterreich. So she was released on bail. At this time, Herman moved in with her. The charges against Dolly were eventually dropped since the police couldn't find any evidence proving that she had murdered Fred. Years passed and the mystery of Fred's death remained unsolved until after seven years. Herman ended his relationship with Dolly in 1930. In 1930, after breaking up with Dolly, Herman went to the police and spilled everything he knew about Otto, including how Dolly had kept him in the attic for 10 long years. A second warrant was issued for Dolly's arrest. She was charged with conspiracy. Meanwhile, Otto Sandhuber, who was living as Walter Klein, was charged with murder. Otto, who had now started a new life, became the prime suspect. When he was caught, he confessed that he was the one who had killed Fred on the night of August 22, 1922. Otto Sandhuber was interrogated, and this was where he told his story. He told investigators that he had an overpowering love for Dolly, which was the reason he agreed to stay with her in her home's attic for 10 years. On that fateful night, he believed Dolly was going to be killed, and so he shot the husband to protect her. He even took officers to the house and showed them where he hid in the attic. When the story got out to the media, they dubbed this case as the Batman case. This was because Otto had lived a cave-like existence in the attic. Despite Otto's claim during the trial that Dolly had held him captive and practically enslaved him, the jury found him guilty of manslaughter. But the statute of limitations had run out and Otto, now 43, walked free. While Berga Dolly Ostrich was a smart woman. She was a sweet talker and had inherited millions of dollars of her husband's money. For her own trial for conspiracy, she hired renowned defense lawyer Jerry Geisler. During her conspiracy trial, Dolly testified that Otto had shot her husband and made it appear like a robbery, 
and she insisted that she was not involved in killing her husband. When asked about the tampering of evidence, she said that she had only lied to the police to shield Otto. Despite hiding Otto for 10 years in the attic, she also admitted during the trial that she had loved her husband. Jerry Geisler was worth his weight in gold, and he won a hung jury at the trial and Dolly was free. Finally, in 1936, all charges against Dolly were dropped. She then found her second husband, Ray Burt Hedrick, a year later. They stayed in Los Angeles together for 30 years, until she passed away in 1961 at the age of 80. What do you think about this shocking case surrounding the life of Dolly Ersterreich? Do you think she deserved to stay free after all she did? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Before we proceed, I've got an exciting surprise for you. We've launched a brand new channel dedicated to intriguing content such as old historical mysteries, cold cases, and particularly chilling horror stories perfect for bedtime. Drop a comment letting us know if you're a fan of horror stories or not. You can find the link in the description below. Let's find out who will be the first to explore it. All right, let's dive back into the video. Tammy Sellers Holland was born in the town in 1964. There's not much information about her early years, but she had two sons while she was married. Details about her husband and their separation are unknown. Afterward, Holland raised her two sons in Trinity, North Carolina. Records indicate that she led a steady, diligent life. Since she was the only breadwinner in her family, she had to work multiple shifts and changed a number of jobs over the years looking for stability. When she turned 36, she finally found a job at Elizabeth's Pizza, where she ended up working for many years to follow. She would work the night shifts so she could be home with her children during the day and provide them with a loving environment as best she could. After some initial challenges, things finally began to go smoothly for the family. Her sons grew up, became self-sufficient and moved out and settled on their own. By the time she was 50 years old in 2014, she had become a grandmother to two more boys. Everything seemed to be going perfectly until one fateful day. An incident occurred that would change all of their lives forever. On the 28th of October, 2014, a surprising 911 call gained the attention of Randolph County Police. The person who made the 911 call was a neighbor of Holland's. According to the details released by the police, Holland's neighbor had been trying to get in touch with her, but hadn't been able to get through and had assumed that she was just busy at work. On the 28th of October, 2014, he decided to go check on her in person. It was around 2.10 a.m. when he reached Holland's house. Surprisingly, he noticed that her lights were still on. He also noticed that Holland's car was still in the driveway when at this time she normally would have been at work at Elizabeth's Pizza in Thomasville. This made him curious as to whether everything was all right, so he went to check on her, thinking that she was home. However, when he knocked on the door, there was no response. Confused, he then went to her window to see if she was inside the house. As he peered through, he saw her legs and then noticed her body lying motionless on the floor. This sent him into a panic and he rushed to call 911. The Randolph County policemen hurriedly made their way to the address given to them by the caller. When they arrived, they opened the door to Holland's home. There she was, lying dead in her living room. She was drenched in a pool of blood. The police and investigators then quickly sealed off the house and brought in their forensic investigators to examine the crime scene and the body. Holland's body was then taken for an autopsy. According to the autopsy report released by the North Carolina Medical Examiner's Office, it was revealed that she was stabbed and then left to bleed to death. There were multiple stab wounds on her neck and body. This was ruled as the cause of death and the case was ruled a homicide. An assault test was also conducted, but no trace of semen was found on her. At the time of her death, she was staying alone in Laughlin Hill Mobile Home Park. After learning the cause of her death, the Randolph County Police started their investigation. At first, they conducted interviews with adjacent homes around Hollins, and they learned that there was even a record of her calling 911 about the matter. However, when she was offered medical assistance and an investigation into the altercation, she declined. During the initial investigation, Randolph County Police had a number of people on their list of suspects, but were unable to unearth any specific evidence that pointed to any one of them being the culprit. Though the police gathered evidence at the crime scene, 
including DNA that did not belong to Holland, they could not find any matches within the system to point them towards who was behind this sinister act. The Randolph County Police did their best to find the culprit. They even offered a handsome reward of $5,000 for information about Holland's murder. But none of the tips they received were viable. Eventually, without any suspects or fresh leads to follow, the case went cold. However, all the important questions remained unanswered. Who could have murdered Tammy Holland? Was it the same person with whom she had an argument on the day before her death? Or was it someone else entirely? Although years had passed without answers, the county's investigators were still eager to solve Tammy Holland's murder case. In 2020, they reopened the case and began a fresh investigation making use of every piece of information at their fingertips, including the genetic evidence collected from the crime scene. They first began the investigation by submitting the DNA evidence to the Cody system. Three years later, the system produced a match. However, to their surprise, they didn't find one suspect, but two. The culprits were identified as Roy Lee White and Florence Keene. On January 26, 2023, a warrant was brought out against Roy Lee White and Florence Keene. Roy was wanted for felony accessory after the fact of first-degree murder, according to the warrant. Who were Roy Lee White and Florence Keene, and what was their connection to Holland? Though we do not have much information on Florence, we do know that Roy was born in 1967, the same year Tammy Holland was born. He married Florence Keene while he was in his mid-twenties. The couple lived together in a mobile home and were actually Holland's neighbors. According to sources, it was found that Roy and his wife Florence were well associated with Holland. As neighbors, they would often meet and talk. With a warrant issued against the pair, the police had now made Roy and Florence wanted criminals. Both Roy and Florence had successfully managed to evade the police for almost a decade, but thanks to DNA evidence, Tammy's culprits had now been identified. With the perpetrators on the loose, Randolph County Police went all in to find the whereabouts of the couple. They looked for Roy Lee White in the neighborhood where he had once lived, but they couldn't find him. He was clearly on the run. Luckily, on February 7, 2023, at 11.10 p.m., the Randolph County Sheriff's Office criminal apprehension team located and apprehended Roy at the O'Connell Lodge on Brentwood Street, High Point, North Carolina. He was then transported to the Randolph County Detention Center and taken in front of the magistrate, who issued a $60,000 secured bond and set a first appearance for February 8, 2023, in Randolph County District Court. With Roy finally arrested, the investigators wanted an open confession about the murder. He complied with his arrest and cooperated with the police. During the interrogation, Roy was asked about the murder and about the whereabouts of his wife Florence. In an open confession, he revealed that on the night of October 28, 2014, it was Florence who stabbed Holland while she bled to death in her home. Roy had quickly assumed control of the situation by concealing the knife that was used to kill when the investigators came to their door after the murder. The couple managed to play their part which was simply enough to not get themselves arrested. They were successful in that, and the police never had any idea that it was them who had committed the crime. The couple then managed to stay out of trouble for almost a decade until DNA evidence led straight to them. However, in 2018, Florence died due to natural causes, which led to Roy getting evicted from his home. He then became a vagabond and started living in hotels for short stints before moving on to the next one. It was in one of these hotels that the Randolph police found Roy and where they finally arrested him. However, the question remained, how had the couple evaded the police this whole time? Why weren't they suspects in the murder of Holland? Well, at the time of the initial investigation before the case went cold, they had been questioned by detectives. However, they had managed to evade detection by pretending to not know anything about the murder. But in 2020, when multiple detectives started looking into the cold case of Tammy Holland again, they found DNA evidence that led them straight to Roy and his wife Florence. Though no further details were released about the murder, after Roy's confession, the sheriff's office did release some details of the murder, which included the DNA evidence, the crime scene details, and other pieces of information. With her killer caught, her loved ones came out to remember Holland when the news was announced. Her friends and family members stated that throughout her life she was a devoted employee and friend and an extremely kind-hearted person. 
Aldo de Porto, the owner of Elizabeth's Pizza where Holland was employed till her last day, said, she was always happy, always happy, smiling when she came in. He also noted that Tammy Holland was the kind of person to always be there for her co-workers and she got along with everyone. She was one of the good people in the world and a very good person to work with. With Holland gone, the staff had continued to feel her loss for all those years. We still remember her, he said. We remember the way she was and we're never going to forget her, you know? She's going to be a lifetime deal. Deporto also added that he doesn't want to judge Roy or Florence. Instead, his thoughts are with Holland's family. We keep Tammy in prayer, he further added. We love the way she was when she was working here. We keep her in her hearts and I pray for her family. What are your thoughts about the case of Tammy Holland? Do you think justice was served? Before we continue, 90% of you haven't subscribed to our channel, so if you like this video, please subscribe. It motivates us to make more content for you. Okay, let's continue. William Newton was born on July 26, 1965, in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. His father was Richard Harriman, but his parents were not married. Six months after William was born, his half-sister, Oliver Michelle, was born. The two siblings were incredibly close as they grew up. As a child, William found a love for art and spent a lot of his spare time writing creatively. His poems were a window into his soul, filled with vivid imagination. He was also an avid reader and yearned for the day when he could share his own stories with the world. Newton was a very intelligent young man. Richard once told the media about his son. Newton spent a good portion of his childhood in the city where he was born. It was there he attended both primary and middle school. Upon completing middle school, he moved with his mother, whose name remains unclear to the city of Ladysmith, which is also within the state of Wisconsin. The change in environment was all too sudden for Newton, but over time he slowly began to get used to it. However, Newton was only able to complete his freshman year of high school in the new city, before his mother began talking about leaving for a new place yet again. This time around, they moved to the city of Oklahoma. This was in the year 1980. Newton soon got tired of the seemingly endless circle of moving from one place to another and desired more stability. And so one day he packed his bags and traveled down to be with his father Richard. He was only 16 at the time and had made up his mind to begin living with his father. He was certain that he would welcome him with open arms. However, this turned out not to be the case. Upon getting to Richard's home in Eau Claire, he was given a shocking reception. Instead of the warm welcome he had anticipated, he was told to leave and Richard refused to let him inside, slamming the door shut in his face. The cold treatment was a stark contrast to what Newton had expected, leaving him broken and defeated. But in that moment, something inside him shifted. He embraced his independence and made the bold decision to set off on his own. The next three years would see Newton traveling around the United States. One of the cities he lived in was Oklahoma, and there he met a man named Terry Elliott with whom he started a romantic relationship. Newton also discovered that he had a passion for beauty and makeup, and so he decided to turn it into a career by taking steps to become a professional beautician. He learned all about skincare, makeup techniques, and the latest beauty trends, and within a matter of months, he had earned his beautician license. In 1984, he moved to Los Angeles and began a new life there. Despite the challenges that came with starting a new life in a new city, he didn't have to wait long for employment opportunities to come knocking. Armed with his wealth of expertise and experience, he quickly caught the attention of an entertainment company producing music videos. Soon enough, they hired him as a beautician and a choreographer. In addition to this, Newton took up a job at a gay bathhouse known as the Hollywood Spa. One fateful night at the spa, he met a man by the name of David Ray, who took an instant liking to him. David had been in the area to judge a beauty contest for a local gay magazine. Their meeting was the start of an unexpected and new journey for Newton. David was an adult movie producer who specialized in gay adult videos. David saw potential in Newton and took him under his wing, introducing him to the industry and helping him land roles in several of his movies. Newton's and David's relationship went beyond just business. It eventually blossomed into a romantic one. 
By 1987, the two formed a partnership and decided to create their own adult movie company which they named London Ray Productions. Newton began working at the company using his expertise as a movie producer, makeup artist and set designer to the table. He produced movies using the alias Bill E. London and also went on to act in several films under the name Billy London and Billy Porter. They would often film movies in their apartment and Newton would redecorate the rooms to make it appear as if they were shooting in different locations. With money beginning to roll in, Newton and David began living life in the fast lane. When they weren't on a movie set, they spent their nights partying at clubs and indulging in drugs. This lifestyle became a routine for them and it was one they would stick to for many years. In 1990, the lovers' relationship took a hit and they began to live separately. Around that time, Newton also felt like he had enough of Los Angeles and that he needed a change of scenery. And so he decided to temporarily move to Las Vegas, where his sister Michelle was living at the time. He was tired of LA, Newton's sister Michelle recalls. He just needed a mental health break. Apart from the fact that Las Vegas was going to offer him something new and exciting, it would also afford him the chance to meet up with his mother, who at the time was planning on settling in the area. Everything was set and Newton began counting down the days to when he would leave for Las Vegas. However, fate had a different plan. On the evening of October 28, 1990, Newton visited a popular club in Los Angeles known as Rage Night Club. He made his way towards his favorite spot within the club and sat down to observe those who were making merry around him. Before long, Newton was feeling the rhythm and he joined in the fun. He sipped on a few drinks and let loose losing himself in the excitement of the night. Hours flew by and soon enough he realized it was time to go home. He got up to leave and anyone who saw him at that moment would be able to instantly tell that he was intoxicated. He managed to make his way to the exit and left the building. That would be the last time anyone would see him alive. The next day, as the week began on a Monday morning, most Los Angeles residents carried on with their daily routines unaware of a murder that would terrify many. That same morning in an alley, directly behind Santa Monica Boulevard, a homeless person searched through dumpsters seeking for food or discarded items. When he opened one particular dumpster, he got the shock of his life. Sitting right in the middle of the trash and staring right back at him was a human head. The rest of the body was nowhere to be found, but the homeless man could spot a pair of feet that had been carelessly thrown beside the head. It was all too much for him to take in, and the man closed the dumpster in horror. He quickly raised an alarm, alerting others about the vile discovery, and in no time, police officers arrived on the scene in their vehicles. The person with the dismembered head in the dumpster was soon identified, and it was none other than Newton. Retired Detective Wendy Burnt was one of the first officers to arrive at the scene on the day of the murder, and was shaken to her core by how brutal it was. It was just so heinous in my mind that something like this could happen and it didn't matter to me that Bill was gay or that he worked in the adult content field, Wendy said. The autopsy that was performed on Newton revealed that he had an addictive drug known as methamphetamine in his system before he was killed. There was also evidence to show that he had been strangled before being beheaded. Detectives immediately began an investigation to determine what exactly had happened to Newton and how he ended up in such a state. Heading the team of investigators assigned to the case was Wendy, and she ensured that she gave it her all. It was a murder that I felt was my responsibility to solve. So I put everything into this case, Wendy said. In the months that followed after the murder, tips poured in from different sources and detectives looked into all of them, but none proved to be of any use. Nobody seemed to know who had killed Newton or where the rest of his body was. Detectives had nothing solid to work with for a long time and eventually the case went cold. In 2005, 15 years after the murder, the Los Angeles Police Department issued a statement that they were making efforts towards reinvestigating the case. But this time too, nothing really came out of the investigation and everything went silent. After this, the case made the news again towards the end of the following year in 2006. This time around, a reporter by the name of Mickey Ski claimed that Newton's father had reportedly reached out to him, saying that the Los Angeles Police Department had neglected his son's murder case and could have done much more to try and solve it. In response to this accusation, 
the LAPD reached out to the public and released a statement to say that they had not given up on the case and were trying their best to solve it. Sadly, Richard never got to see justice for his son's murder. He passed away in his home on May 30th, 2011 at the age of 65. Around 2020, two authors and best friends, Christopher Rice and Eric Shaw Quinn developed a fascination with Newton's murder. Christopher had gotten to know about the case after an adult entertainment journalist wrote about it. And since then, it had remained fixed in his mind. Christopher and Eric also happened to co-host a podcast known as The Dinner Party Show, which they began in 2012. It happened that during one of the podcast episodes, Christopher decided to mention his interest in Newton's murder and how fascinated he was that there had never been an arrest and no publicly announced leads in the case. He then concluded by asking the listeners for helpful information regarding the case. Two months after this, Christopher and Eric did another episode of their podcast and in this one, they shared some of the things they had been able to dig up since the last time they talked about Newton's murder. According to Christopher, an unidentified man had reached out to him, saying that he had some important information about the murder case. According to what the man told Christopher, he had seen Newton at Rage Nightclub the evening before he turned up dead in a dumpster. However, he claimed Newton had not left the club alone, but had been in the company of a man that looked like the well-known serial killer, Jeffrey Dahmer. When Christopher did a background check on Dahmer, he discovered that he was a serial killer who murdered 17 boys and men in the Milwaukee area from the late 70s to the early 90s. But in 1991, a year after Newton's gruesome murder, Dahmer was finally arrested by the authorities and was sentenced to 15 consecutive life sentences. There was no doubt that Dahmer's profile fitted that of someone who could have potentially murdered Newton. However, there was no way to confirm this because Dahmer was already dead. He was attacked and beaten to death by a fellow inmate back in November 1994. After detailing in the podcast all he had uncovered about Newton's murder and its possible connection with Dahmer, Christopher continued to remain hopeful that someone who knew something would come forward with additional information. Around the same time in 2012, Detective John Lamberti of the Los Angeles Police Department began to develop an interest in this case. After going through all the materials his predecessors had on the murder, he was shocked by the amount of work they had put towards having it solved. They investigated the hell out of this case, Detective Lamberti told the media. Lamberti also began to look more intently at every angle. One of the first things he did was do a Google search about Newton's name. In the search result, he came across the episode of Christopher and Eric's podcast in which they talked about Newton's murder and speculated about Dahmer being his killer. Clicking on it and listening to all the two men had to say did nothing but pique Detective Lamberti's interest in the case. At some point after this, he reached out to both Christopher and Eric to schedule a meeting with them. During this meeting, the three men swapped information and talked extensively about all they knew about the case. From that moment, an alliance was formed and they had one mutual goal, which was to solve the case for good. While all of this was going on, Rachel Mason, a documentary filmmaker, has also gotten obsessed with the case and was busy carrying out her own underground investigation. She had learned about Newton's murder by accident. This was back in 2017 when she was working on a documentary about an adult bookstore and gay adult content store called The Circus of Books. While looking for solid content for the documentary, she paid a visit to a local writer and an activist by the name of Mike Szymanski. Mike had an old collection of West Hollywood photos and he had agreed to allow her to look through them. As he and Rachel were going through one of his notebooks during the search, a brittle newspaper article from 1990 suddenly fell out and caught Rachel's eye. The article was about Newton's murder and how the authorities had no leads as to who had carried out the act. Rachel immediately asked Mike about what it was all about and Mike gladly filled her in on all the details he knew surrounding the mysterious murder. She was intrigued by the story she heard, however she did not think much of it after that. She went to work on the Circus of Books film, and after completing it, she immediately started searching for a new project to work on. It was during this period that she recollected the story she had heard from Mike about Newton's murder. She couldn't shake it off and slowly grew fascinated by it. This made her take a closer look and she also began investigating the case. Rachel was determined to gather every piece of information she could find. For this, she resolved to ask the public for any tips or insights they might have. 
and that was when she received a message from Clark Williams, a gay stay-at-home dad living in Sherman Oaks. Williams grew up in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, just like Newton. Due to this, he believed he could help Rachel fill in the blanks of Newton's life story, since he had a unique perspective on what it was like growing up in Eau Claire. Rachel was thrilled at the new development. She wondered if she had finally gotten someone who could shed some light on the mystery of Newton's upbringing. To find out, she eagerly arranged a meeting with Williams to hear what he had to say. During the meeting, she found out that Williams had first gotten to know about Newton's murder while scrolling through a Facebook group. He had stumbled on a particular post about the 1990 murder and it had immediately caught his attention. And as he read the details, he was struck by how similar Newton's background was to his. From that moment, he could not stop thinking about the case and decided to take matters into his own hands. Something was propelling me, moving me to just get involved in whatever capacity that I could, Williams said. What I really wanted to do was to help tell Billy's story, because I think he reflected the lives of so many young gay men and teenagers who came up in that time, he added. After connecting with Rachel and sharing all that he knew with her, he began to nurture an even deeper interest in the murder. Eventually, Detective Lamberti also got to find out about Rachel and William's interest in the case, and he soon brought them into the fold. Every one of William's free moments became an opportunity for him to try and get closer to solving the case. It wasn't long after this that he learned of a local amateur detective named Rick Pace who had dedicated a good portion of his time and energy to cracking the mystery of Newton's murder after it had occurred. Rick had also worked closely with retired Detective Wendy in the initial investigation. Much to his disappointment, Williams found out that Rick was long dead, so there was no way to reach out to him. However, through his tireless and thorough research, he was able to find out some other important details about Rick. And this was that in addition to owning and running a skate shop in West Hollywood, Rick also led a double life as a gay adult video producer under the alias Richard Lawrence. Williams realized he needed to find the link between Rick and Newton, as they had both been working in the same industry at the same time. Williams began to meticulously go through the credits of Rick's films in search of names of actors, producers, and editors. His aim was to track down anyone who may still be alive to share their stories. The movies he placed priority on were those that had been produced around the time of Newton's murder. One film in particular caught his attention. It was titled The Devil and Danny Webster, and it had introduced a promising young actor named Billy Houston. Williams immediately took a special interest in Billy and began to uncover as much as he could about him. He discovered that Billy's real name was Daryl Lynn Madden, and he was in prison serving a life sentence for the murder of two men. According to what Williams found out, when he had been caught, Daryl had confessed to the police about his crimes saying that he and another man named Bradley Qualls had committed the first offense. On the day of the incident, both Daryl and Bradley had gone out with a sinister plan to initiate Bradley into a white supremacist group known as Chaos Squad Skinheads. And to do this, they had to kidnap a gay man. They waited in the area patiently for an unlucky individual to pass by. A man named Stephen Domer was the one who unfortunately fell into their well-laid trap. Both Daryl and Bradley lured their victims to a deserted area, bound him in his own vehicle, and took him on a ride. Despite the pleas of the poor man, it all ended with him being strangled to death with a coat hanger. After seeing that they had killed him, the two men then disposed of the body in a nearby creek. In a twist, Daryl later shot his accomplice, Bradley, for some unknown reason and then fled the scene, but he could not hide for long and was later captured by the police. This had all happened in the city of Oklahoma. Williams did not stop after finding out all this. He went further and soon found out that Daryl had done an interview for a book titled American Honor Killings. Williams knew that the book could contain more potentially important information and so decided to try to get his hands on it. He ordered the book online and after waiting for what seemed like an eternity it finally arrived. He immediately began reading, and as he flipped through the pages, he was struck with disbelief at what he read. Daryl not only talked about taking the life of Stephen in the book, but he also talked about another killing in Los Angeles. However, he failed to provide details about that particular incident. The shocking revelation left William stunned and excited. He knew he was onto something. Newton had been murdered in Los Angeles and Daryl had confessed to killing someone in that same city. 
William strongly believed that Newton was the individual Daryl had referred to. But to be certain, he decided to reach out to Detective Lamberti and inform him about everything he had found out. Lamberti wasted no time and immediately set to work. He did a background check on Daryl. To his surprise, he discovered that the Gay Adult Video Production Company, which Daryl had worked for, was situated on Santa Monica Boulevard, which was the area where Newton's body had been found. The detective knew it was all too much of a coincidence and decided that he was going to visit Daryl to question him. And so on January 4th, Detective Lamberti and Detective Tamara Mamiez traveled to Oklahoma where Daryl was serving the sentence for his crimes. Much to their surprise, they found out that Daryl was now a proud transgender woman and an Orthodox Jew who had changed her name to Darylin. The air buzzed with anticipation as Lamberti and Mamiez took their seats across from Darylin who sat with a confident grace, ready to answer any questions the two detectives had. During the course of their conversation, they asked Daryl about Newton's murder and were shocked when Daryl was immediately aware of who they were talking about. Daryl explained that on the day of Newton's murder, he and two of his friends had seen Newton walking along the street. Newton had appeared intoxicated and for this reason, they saw him as an easy target for a robbery. He was soon abducted, but things went south from there. Daryl confessed that it had ended with Newton being strangled to death. Detective Lamberti and his colleague were shell-shocked as Darylin came to the end of the explanation. They could hardly believe their ears. Next, they then asked how and why Newton's body had been mutilated. But Darylin claimed to have nothing to do with it. Darylin told them that Newton's body was left with his two friends after they killed him. When asked for the identity of the two accomplices, Darylin refused to mention any names. In the days that followed this, Detective Lamberti presented a strong case against Darolin to the L.A. County District Attorney George Gaskin's office. However, much to their disappointment, Gaskin's office announced that they would not be filing charges against him as the evidence was not strong enough. But despite this, Lamberti and the others who had worked round the clock on the case were beyond happy that it had finally been solved, and the closure they had given her by finally solving it. Newton's murder was a cruel event that shook the city of Los Angeles for over three decades. The thought of his killer finally being identified and being behind bars brings a sense of justice being rendered. However, the whereabouts of the rest of his body is still a mystery that may haunt the city forever. Mary Mathis Davis was born on February 12, 1958, in Lexington. Not much is known about her early life, but she had a sister named Lisa Henkel whom she shared her childhood with. They did everything together, from playing games to exploring outdoors. Lisa fondly remembers Mary as a beautiful and kind-hearted person who could brighten any room with her infectious smile. Mary had a special gift for making everyone feel comfortable and welcomed. At some point, Mary met a man by the name of Richard Davis. As they got to know each other, a spark ignited between them, and before they knew it, they were swept up in a whirlwind romance. Their love grew stronger by the day, and Richard knew that he wanted to spend the rest of his life with Mary. And so one day, with a heart full of hope, he asked her to be his wife. Mary was overwhelmed with joy, and without hesitation she said yes. After the proposal, the two lovebirds began to eagerly plan their life together as a couple. They spent hours on end talking about their future, discussing their dreams and hopes for the life they were about to embark on. The wedding day soon arrived and the couple exchanged their vows in a romantic and intimate ceremony. After the wedding celebrations, Mary and Richard found themselves starting a new chapter of their lives and looked forward in anticipation to the journey ahead. The years flew by and before long, Mary and Richard were parents to two beautiful children. Their first child was a boy, while the second was a girl named Tracy who was born in 1986. The joy of parenthood was evident in the couple's home as the sounds of laughter and the pitter Mary's heart overflowed with love and she relished every moment spent with her children. To provide for her growing family, she took a job at Lanier's Ace Hardware, a store in Lexington. It wasn't the most glamorous work, but Mary didn't mind. She was grateful for the opportunity to earn a steady income. Though the money Mary earned wasn't much, it was enough to help cover the bills and put food on the table. Despite the challenges that came with juggling the responsibilities of motherhood and working a job, 
Mary remained steadfast in her determination to make the best life possible for her family. As the days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months, life continued at a good pace. Mary's family was thriving and she felt a sense of contentment in her heart. But just when any of them least expected it, tragedy was waiting just around the corner, ready to strike. On the morning of May 30th, 1987, Mary left her home for work as usual. That Saturday felt like every other day, but little did she know that it would be her last on earth. As Mary arrived at work, she greeted her colleagues with a smile and began to go about her day. She jumped into her tasks with enthusiasm. However, as the hours ticked by, she began to feel increasingly restless and hungry. By noon, her stomach was growling and she found herself counting down the minutes to her lunch break. Eventually the moment arrived and she was relieved that she had the chance to finally escape the confines of her workplace. Her heart also raced with anticipation as she imagined settling down to a delicious meal. She reached into her bag to make sure that she had enough money to buy herself lunch, and after confirming this, she made her way out of her store and headed for a nearby restaurant. This would be the last time anyone would see Mary alive. She never returned to work. Once the time for her lunch break was done, her absence became more noticeable with each passing second. Her colleagues couldn't help but wonder what was keeping her. As the minutes turned into what felt like hours, their confusion turned to worry. What could be taking her so long? Was she okay? A million questions raced through their mind as they tried to make sense of Mary's prolonged absence. With no sign of her return, they knew that they had to find her and fast. Without hesitation, one of them volunteered to search for her at the restaurant she had gone to for lunch. With heart racing, the co-worker rushed to the restaurant, but Mary was nowhere to be found. The restaurant staff there were of no help either, and the situation was becoming increasingly dire. The co-worker returned to the hardware store and reported that there was no sign of her. With this, fear began to grip the workers at the hardware store, and they knew they had to take more serious action. Without wasting another moment, they picked up the phone and dialed the emergency line. They told the operator everything they knew and within minutes the police were on their way. They also called Mary's parents and her husband to let the family know what was happening. It was a difficult call to make but they knew that it was the right thing to do. Police immediately began searching for Mary that very day but at first the search yielded nothing. There was simply no trace of her. As the news of Mary's disappearance spread, the community became gripped with fear and uncertainty. Mary's family, on the other hand, were left to grapple with the agony of not knowing where she was or what had happened to her. However, they prayed and hoped that their beloved Mary would be found safe and sound. Richard could hardly sleep a wink that night. He tossed and turned in bed as his thoughts kept him awake. He knew deep down that something was terribly wrong. Mary's disappearance did not make sense to him and he knew that it was not just a simple case of getting lost in the city. His thoughts drifted to their children and how he would face them the next day. They had been asking about their mother, innocently unaware of the danger she might be in. Richard couldn't bear the thought of telling them that she might never be coming home again, but he knew that he had to be strong for them. As the sun rose the following day, the search for Mary continued, but all the efforts seemed to be in vain. The police and Mary's family were on edge, desperate to find any leads on her sudden disappearance. As the day went on, the police suddenly received an emergency call that a dead body had been discovered behind the building of a local supermarket known as Winn-Dixie. A small team of police officers immediately raced to the scene. As they arrived, they saw a small crowd gathering around the area where the body had been discovered, and the officers quickly moved in to secure the area. They could see that the body had been there for some time. It was already beginning to give off a faint smell of decomposition. Upon closer inspection, they were able to identify the body as that of the woman they had been searching for. Shock and disbelief were evident on the officers' faces, but they knew that they had work to do. The cause of death was not immediately apparent, so the police began to search the surrounding area for any clues. They also questioned the employees at the supermarket, but none of them seemed to know anything. Following this, the body was then taken away for an autopsy. That same day, a uniformed police officer arrived at the home of Mary's parents. He asked for Mary's father, 
who immediately stepped outside to speak to him. The air was thick with tension as the officer delivered the heartbreaking news. He explained what little they knew about what had happened to Mary and offered his condolences. The news was devastating and Mary's father was left shattered and grief-stricken. The rest of the family was also shocked and saddened. A few days after Mary's body was found, the results of the autopsy were out and they revealed that she had been strangled to death. In addition, it was also discovered that she had also been sexually assaulted. With this, her death was ruled a homicide. And so, as Mary's family struggled to come to terms with her loss and were left to pick up the pieces, the authorities began an investigation into her death. There were a lot of unanswered questions and they were determined to get to the root of it all. Detectives had with them pieces of evidence in the form of DNA that had been collected from the crime scene. However, due to the lack of technology at the time, there was little that could be done with this. Running down every lead and tip that came their way, they even asked for help from the public, hoping that someone would come forward with information that would crack the case wide open, but to no avail. The killer seemed to have vanished into thin air, leaving the detectives feeling defeated. The days dragged on, turning into weeks and months, but the killer remained elusive. With each passing day, the detectives felt their grip on the case slipping away. Mary's family, however, never gave up hope and believed that one day justice would be served. They tried their best to move on with their lives, but the wounds of grief remained fresh in their hearts. In 2011, almost 25 years after Mary's murder, her sister Lisa made a bold move by speaking out about the tragedy that had befallen her family. She opened up to the media about the heartbreak they had endured, sharing how difficult life had been without her beloved sister by her side. As Lisa reminisced on their happy memories together, she also shared that the family had never given up hope that one day they would get the closure they so desperately sought. Yet despite the heartache and loss, she revealed that the family had no interest in seeking revenge and that forgiveness was something she was willing to extend to whoever had taken Mary's life. In 2022, a new team of detectives that were assigned to the murder case decided to review the evidence available. They were well aware of the advances in DNA technology and knew that they had a better chance of solving the case now as compared to when it happened back in 1987. Following this, the detectives then submitted some physical evidence to the North Carolina State Crime Lab, going by the positive result that was obtained from the analysis of the evidence. The North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation was contacted to take a look at the case. Things began to move at a fast pace from there. The State Bureau of Investigation reached out to OTHRM, a private laboratory in Texas that specializes in forensic genealogy. DNA evidence from the case was then sent to OTHRM and their scientists were able to develop a genealogical profile for an unknown male suspect. After months of hard work, the unknown male suspect was finally identified. It was a man by the name of Russell Grant Wood. The discovery was a relief for detectives and they knew without a doubt that the case was finally close to being solved. However, there was a problem. After doing a check on Russell's background, they found out that he had died back in 2013 at the age of 58, so there was no way to bring him to justice. According to what Lexington Police Chief Robbie Rummage later revealed during a press conference, Russell had been previously identified as a suspect in the case, but due to lack of sufficient evidence at the time, detectives had no choice but to direct their focus away from him. That was not all. It was also discovered that both Russell and Mary had known each other, but it is not clear what kind of relationship had existed between them. If Russell had been alive, the state would have proceeded with indictments and charged him with first-degree murder, first-degree kidnapping, and first-degree rape. On February 3, 2023, Mary's surviving family were notified of the breakthrough in the case, and they expressed their gratitude to the detectives for their dedication to the case. We prayed that one day we would find the person who violently murdered our beloved Mary. We now have some answers. Although that won't bring Mary back, it does give us a sense of closure, Lori Martin, Mary's niece, had said. Mary's family later held a celebration in honor of her memory at the Forest Hill Memorial Park on February 12, 2023. She would have turned 65 on that day if she had still been alive. Mary was a light in this world and we were blessed to have her as long as we did. She was a loving mother, sister, wife, aunt and friend. 
We know she is resting easily in the arms of our Lord and Savior, Lori said. Although the mystery surrounding Mary's death has been unraveled and her killer has been identified, there are still a lot of questions that we will never know the answers to. What kind of relationship do you think existed between Mary and Russell? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. This is Rachel Zendejas, born on November 20th, 1960. She had an older brother named Roy Rodriguez. Details about their early life are sparse, but Roy had already established himself by the time Rachel started supporting herself financially. Rachel married young and became a mother to two daughters while still in her teens. Her first daughter, Eva, was born in 1978, followed by Monica in 1980. However, Rachel faced challenges in her marriage. So at the age of 20 in 1980, she decided to leave him. However, Rachel wasn't well off financially, which also meant that with the divorce, she would have to start working and supporting herself and her two daughters. By 1981, a year after the birth of her youngest daughter, she was finally free from her toxic however. Instead of simply working odd jobs and struggling to get by, she aspired to have a degree. And since she hadn't been able to complete her studies because of her marriage and children, Rachel thought that she would finally take this opportunity to continue her studies. She enrolled at Oxnard College in California. While she got back on her feet, she moved in with her brother in Camarillo, and he helped her get her family together and get back on her feet. Being a full-time student, working shifts at a part-time job, and being a full-time mom, things were difficult for Rachel. She was finding it difficult to split her time and attention between all these things. So she decided to hire multiple babysitters for her two kids while she was out at work or college. During the day, she would go to college, then work her shifts, and then she would return home in the evening. Her babysitters would only make their way home if it was too late. Rachel would often drop them off at their homes herself. This was Rachel's routine until the fateful event that would change the lives of those around her. On January 18, 1981, two newspaper delivery boys stumbled onto Rachel's naked body in a carport in Camarillo, near her brother's apartment complex where she was living. She had never returned home the night before after dropping the babysitters back home. When the newspaper boys saw the body, they quickly called 911 and reported the matter. When the police arrived at the crime scene, an immediate investigation was launched. Rachel's body seemed to have bruise marks over her neck and shoulders. Her body was also found completely bare. When the investigators conducted an autopsy, they found that Rachel had been strangled to death. She had also been forcefully assaulted prior to her murder. The gravity of the crime was heavy, which made the police want to find the killer as soon as possible. They theorized that Rachel had been ambushed outside her brother's Camarillo home. She was then assaulted on the patio of a nearby vacant apartment and then strangled and died of asphyxiation. The police conducted detailed interviews with neighbors and others who lived in the vicinity, hoping to find out if anyone had seen or heard anything the night before. According to her neighbors and her brother, Rachel had gone to drop off the babysitters like she did most days after returning from work. However, on that day, something bad happened when she got out of her vehicle after returning home. The crime scene was crucial in helping the police gather evidence. There were sperm traces and fingerprints all over her naked body. However, at the time, DNA evidence couldn't be used to identify suspects in the system. It could only be used to match against a suspect who had already been identified. The police looked into a number of other leads and even tried retracing her steps that night, but they found nothing. Eventually, the case went cold. The second woman involved in this story is Lisa Gondek, who was also born in 1960 on the 9th of November. She lived in Connecticut throughout her childhood and teenage years. However, when she turned 21, she decided to move out and find a job to support herself. Though there is not much information about Lisa's background available, we do know that she never married and did not have any children. In 1981, Lisa moved to California from her hometown in Connecticut. When Lisa got to Oxnard, she moved in with her childhood best friend and was living with her. Being a humble and easygoing person, Lisa never found it hard to make friends. Due to her friendly nature, it was easy for her to get a job. Within a few days of her moving to another state, 
Lisa managed to find work at a teen clothing store in the Esplanade Shopping Center in Oxnard. She then went on to work there for almost a year. However, little did she know that her life would soon come to a tragic end. On December 12, 1981, a 911 call sparked the attention of the police in Oxnard. The call reported a fire at an Oxnard apartment. When the firefighters arrived, they did their best to control the damage. However, they were shocked to find a dead, naked woman in the bathtub. Upon seeing this, the firefighters immediately notified the police for assistance. When the police arrived, they identified the victim as none other than Lisa Gondik. She was 21 when she died. An autopsy conducted after securing crucial DNA evidence from the crime scene confirmed that Lisa had been forcefully assaulted before she was killed. There were strangulation marks around her neck similar to the ones found on Rachel's body. Whoever committed the crime had killed her and then set the apartment on fire to cover their tracks. But who could have made that 911 call? Well, a further investigation revealed that Lisa's neighbors had heard screams. However, they didn't call 911 until they smelled smoke coming from her apartment. Right before she was murdered, Lisa had just informed her mother that she would be home for Christmas. Sadly, she would now never be able to make it. With two murders having been committed within a year in Oxnard, the police were under pressure to catch the culprits behind either of these murders. However, it was difficult to crack the case. The investigators in the murder of Lisa found that there were no probable suspects on the list of people they had interrogated. And with no further leads to follow, they eventually had to give up on the case and just like Rachel's case before it, it too went cold. In 2004, 23 years after the murders of Lisa and Rachel, advancements in DNA technology had now made solving cold cases easier. Since all that was needed to be done was to enter the DNA evidence into the national systems and wait for the results to show. The Oxnard police and investigators who were handling these two cases wanted to take this opportunity to solve the cases since they had crucial evidence that had been collected from both of the crime scenes. When they re-examined the files from both cases, they began to notice the similarities between the two murders. The first were the marks found on their bodies. Both Rachel and Lisa had strikingly similar marks, and both of them were forcefully assaulted and strangled. The second similarity was that both victims had visited a pub named Huntington's in the hours before their deaths. Though the pub is now closed, it was a hot spot that was just across from the Esplanade Mall where Lisa had worked. On uploading the DNA evidence found in both crime scenes, there were no matches in the system at the time. But the DNA matched the sample from the other case. This is when the police realized that the similarities between Rachel's and Lisa's death were because both of them had been killed by the same person. This meant that the crimes committed against Lisa and Rachel were committed by the same suspect who was still on the loose. However, there was a downside to this. No one matched the suspect profile the police were searching for. There was no information on the suspect in the national systems, which eventually made the case turn cold once again. Almost four decades later, the murders of Lisa and Rachel still remain unsolved. Though the police found out that the suspect they were looking for was one person and not two, they couldn't proceed any further in solving this case. Rachel's brother Roy Rodriguez regularly called the police and asked for updates on his sister's murder case. And why shouldn't he? Rachel was taken too soon, leaving behind her two young daughters who were orphaned at the tender ages of two and one. In order to try and find a match, the detectives and police officers working on this double homicide cold case decided to team up and work with genetic genealogists in 2019. The hunt for the suspect led to the cold cases being opened again as active investigations. This time, the investigators reviewed user-submitted DNA profiles that were made publicly available. This they thought was a great start as it would provide them with enough information to learn more about their genealogy and perhaps even trace the suspect through their family tree. As the team worked together, they managed to finally narrow down their search to one person. This person also matched the evidence at the crime scene in 1981. His name was identified as Tony Garcia and he was now a 68-year-old man. Tony Garcia was born in 1955. His birthplace was in the state of New Mexico. When he grew older, he joined the Navy. After completing his services with the Navy, Tony then found work as a karate instructor in Oxnard, California. 
When the Ventura County Police then tracked his age and his whereabouts in 1981, they found that Tony was 26 years old at the time and would often visit Huntington's. It was there that he noticed Rachel and stalked her. He then showed up unannounced on January 18, 1981 and ended her life. Lisa Gondek also used to frequent the same pub after Rachel was murdered, and this led to her death almost 11 months later. After these revelations, further background checks done on Tony revealed that he worked as a carpenter after the killings in 1981. What was even more astonishing was that Tony was actually in the same town the whole time. Once he had settled in Oxnard, he continued to live there even after committing these heinous crimes. All the time that the investigation into Rachel's and Lisa's murders was ongoing, he managed to remain hidden in plain sight. However, why hadn't the Ventura police found him suspicious? Well, no one knew it was him until 2019, when DNA evidence gathered from the crime scene revealed his identity. He managed to evade arrest for another four years. No one could find him. It was only quite recently, in February 2023, that Ventura County law enforcement arrested and charged Garcia for two counts of murder with special allegations. These charges included multiple killings, kidnapping, and forcible sexual assault. However, the district attorney's office could not decide whether to seek the death penalty or life in prison without parole. The 68-year-old was booked and bail was set at $2 million bond. In February 2023, Eric Nazarenko, the Ventura County District Attorney, gave a statement on the case. After more than four decades, justice is finally coming to the families of Rachel Zendejas and Lisa Gondek. Thankfully, Ventura County Police never gave up on solving the murder of these two young souls, Lisa and Rachel. All we know for now is that Tony is held at Ventura County Main Jail while police search more information from the public, including any possible links to other crimes. What did you think about the solving of these cold cases of Rachel Zendejas and Lisa Gondek? Do you think justice was served? Jillian McKeon was born on October 30, 1983, in Drogheda, Ireland, to parents George and Edith. A few years later, her family moved to Australia when her father was offered a job in Perth. In Australia, she attended Bull Creek Primary School and later continued her education at Ross Moyne High School. A friend from primary school said Jill had a huge passion for drama and was a natural entertainer. She was such a vivacious girl, really bright, bubbly, and so gorgeous. Her family would return to Ireland in 1996 where she would attend a grammar school and then later on a community college. Her parents returned to Perth in 2004 but she stayed in Ireland and attended University College Dublin, where she would ultimately obtain her Bachelor of Arts degree. During her time as a student, she worked in the student bars. It was also here that she met Tom Marr and they soon started a relationship. Her big personality packed a huge punch. Bright and friendly, she had a huge impact on those she met. A childhood friend said, Jill was just the most beautiful soul. She was nice to everyone she met and she wouldn't hurt a fly. In 2008, Jill and Tom married and the following year they relocated to Australia. After settling in Melbourne, she began working for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, also known as ABC. Her job at ABC was as a unit coordinator and also included occasional on-air work at the 774 ABC Melbourne radio station. Her parents were again living in Perth and she kept in regular contact with them too. The bond between her and her family remained strong. Her brother Michael moved back to Australia after living for a while in Canada. No matter where they were in the world, they always paid time for each other. Jill went out with co-workers to the Brunswick Green Bar on Sydney Road. After staying there for a while, they moved on to Bar Etiquette, which was also located on Sydney Road. As the night began to wind down, at around 1.30 a.m. Jill decided it was time to leave and so left the bar on foot to walk back home to the flat she shared with Tom. According to the Irish Independent, her brother had attempted to call her several times but got no answer. Back at the flat, Tom woke up to realize she still hadn't come home and so went out to search for her at around 4 a.m. After going everywhere he could think of without finding a trace of her, and with her still not answering her phone, he contacted the police. As the news that she was missing began to circulate, her colleagues at ABC took to Twitter to get the message out there. 
A Facebook page called Help Find Jill Ma was set up on the 23rd of September, and a poster campaign was launched to circulate as many images of her as possible. The scale of the search and media interest was huge. Within just five days of the Facebook page being launched, it had received over 100,000 likes. As the search continued on September 24th, an important discovery was made. In the laneway near Hope Street, Jill's bag was found. Hope Street was not far from where she lived with her husband. Following this, the police made an announcement that so many people had been dreading. They were handing the case over to the homicide squad. Her husband Tom also went before the media to talk about his wife's disappearance. The following day, officers had yet another breakthrough. An employee of the Duchess Boutique, a bridal shop on Sydney Road where she had been out with her friends, handed in some CCTV footage that was then released by Victoria Police. The recording was limited as it was filmed through the window, but it showed a man in a blue hoodie walking around outside the shop. Around four minutes later at 1.42 a.m., Jill could be seen on the footage talking to him and showing him her mobile phone. This was the last known sighting of Jill Ma. Following the uncovering of the CCTV footage, they decided to change tack. They were now looking for the man in the blue hoodie. They also checked her cell phone records, which showed that her phone had been moving down the freeway on the night she disappeared, meaning it must have been in a car. After checking the license plates of the cars caught on camera, the police came to a horrifying realization. Her phone was moving at the same time as a car that was registered to a well-known and dangerous sex offender. Adrian Ernest Bailey, aged 41, was arrested at his home in Coburg and was then taken into custody. He underwent hours of interviews and interrogation before he eventually confessed everything. Officers were stunned as he admitted to them he had strangled Jill with his bare hands in a lane just off Hope Street. Eight hours later at 10 p.m. on the 27th of September, he led officers to where her body had been left in a shallow grave on Black Hill Road. She was just a matter of weeks away from her 30th birthday. Following his arrest, his defense lawyer requested a suppression order be in place to ban the publishing of any potentially damaging material about him. This request was granted. The police also came to a horrifying realization. They found out that Bailey had actually been on parole when he had raped and murdered Jill. He had been jailed back in 2002 for 11 years after raping five prostitutes over a six-month period. He served eight years of his sentence before being released in 2010. His criminal history had began as an 18-year-old when he raped the 16-year-old girlfriend of his sister. In August 1990, just one month after he turned 19, he attempted to rape and threatened to kill a 17-year-old girl who he didn't know. And just four months after that, he attempted to rape a 16-year-old girl. She was hitchhiking and he abducted her in his car and drove out to a remote area before carrying out the attack. In 1991, he was sent to prison for these offenses after pleading guilty. He served just 22 months of a five-year sentence. He would later admit that he had actually cheated the system and just gone through the motions of rehabilitation in prison in order to secure an early release. He had convinced them he was no longer a danger. He admitted this during the court appearance regarding the 16 counts of rape committed between September 2000 and March 2001. These were all committed against the five sex workers working in St. Kilda. On one of these occasions, he apologized to the victim before laughing at her telling her he would do it again and then driving away. He pled guilty to all charges. These were the offenses he was on bail for when he murdered Jill Marr. Upon his release from prison in August 2011, the then 40-year-old Bailey spotted a man eating outside a cafe at around 1.30 a.m., Bailey proceeded to hurl abuse at the 20-year-old before punching him in the face, breaking his jaw and leaving him unconscious. When being interviewed by officers following his arrest for the rape and murder of Jill, he said, Man, I just, I should be in jail anyway, you know? I shouldn't have been let out last time, simple. And I say that in hope someone hears that and they don't ever let me out again. How many chances does a person need? The father of four also said, you know, it really wasn't my intention to hurt her, you know that. I want to do the right thing. I'm going to go to jail for a long time. I hope they bring back the death penalty before I get sentenced. I have no life left. There's no excuses for this. Her family this week, it must have been hell. You know what I mean? 
I can't imagine how, how she felt. But I know how I felt. It's not nice, man. It's not nice. And all I thought was, what have I done? I don't know what else to say, man. I don't know what else to say. At 2 a.m. on the 28th of September, Bailey was charged with the rape and murder of Jill Mar. And an hour later had an out-of-sessions hearing that lasted for about 90 seconds. He was held on remand to await trial. The gravity of what he had done appeared to be weighing heavily on him as he attempted suicide while in custody. The one question that people wanted answered was why. Why had he taken the life of a stranger in the most brutal and savage way imaginable? He told a psychologist, Professor James Ogloff, that he had attempted to kiss and touch her outside of the Brunswick Laneway just off of Sydney Road. She responded to it by stepping back and then slapping him across the face. He told the psychologist that this response had enraged him, and he lost it after she'd rejected his advances. After the rape, she hit him with her mobile phone and then threatened to call the police. He responded by strangling her. He sat in the laneway, panic-stricken and crying, unsure as to what to do. He then drove home to get a shovel before returning to the crime scene. He dragged her body into his car and drove out to Jinsman South, where he dug the grave and attempted to bury her. When the news broke about what had happened to Jill Marr, everyone was devastated. Shortly after her body was found, the Australian flag at the ABC South Bank studios were flown at half-mast as a sign of respect. Part of a statement on the ABC website read, Jill was a much-loved member of the local radio family. She was witty, intelligent, and great company. Her friends and workmates at the ABC will miss her greatly. Jill was an innocent victim, a young, vibrant woman with her whole life in front of her. Radio host John Fain also paid an emotional tribute to her live on air. As news began to spread on social media of her body being found, in just one day, more than 600 messages of condolence had appeared on the Help Us Find Gilmar Facebook page. Also that day, around 12 million Twitter timelines had referred to her. It wasn't just her immediate circle that were affected by the tragedy. The media reported that even inmates at the Melbourne Romance Center were deeply affected so much so that 40 of them attended a requiem mass in the prison chapel, led by the chaplain Father Joe Caddy. Pay their respects to Jill and honor her life. The shock and disbelief was palpable. Thousands of bouquets were being laid out in tribute to her. As she was a Roman Catholic, many were left outside a church near to where she had disappeared. A candlelight vigil was also held at the church to honor her memory. A major problem immediately after Bailey's arrest came when some began searching for him in the white pages. People found an A. Bailey, which listed his address and telephone number. And before long the number was being inundated with abusive phone calls. The problem was, this wasn't Adrian Bailey. It was a man called Andrew Bailey. After the case of mistaken identity came to light, the phone calls and harassment stopped when people realized they had got the wrong person. In her hometown of Drogheda, Ireland, a memorial service was held on the 28th of September at St. Oliver's Community College, with thousands in attendance. On the 30th of September, just two days after Jill's body was found, a Melbourne photographer Philip Verna organized a public march. He said he only expected around 100 people to turn up, but the response was massive. More than 30,000 people walked side by side along Sydney Road in memory of Jill. The themes of violence against women became talking points in the media too. After Bailey had been charged, various Facebook users began to create pages about the case. As some of them were openly hostile towards Bailey, the Victoria Police tried unsuccessfully to have the pages taken down. As a result of this, the Premier of Victoria suggested it might be necessary to reform the law so that social media coverage could not prejudice a potential jury. According to the Irish Independent, her husband Tom also backed these calls to have the posts in question removed. Facebook refused to remove the content, leading to criticism from the Victoria Police Chief he told Fairfax Radio that Facebook would not cooperate in removing the page and that he was seeking legal advice. Though social media has been enormously helpful in this investigation, it's also been very, very difficult. And we had calls to speak to Facebook over the weekend and ask them to take the particular site down, he said. Now, they've refused to do that. When you see the hatred that's incited by some of these sites, 
It is very much the antithesis of what we saw yesterday with the 30,000 people taking to the streets, saying let's try and make this a safer and fairer community. The Reclaim the Night movement also organized a march on the 20th of October. The Reclaim the Night march aims to give women a voice and empower them to feel safe walking the streets at night, as well as highlight the issues of personal safety that many women find themselves trying to navigate on a daily basis. On the 4th of October, Jill Ma's private funeral service took place at Melbourne Forkner Memorial Park. The family thanked the public again for their support and the condolences that they had been offered. Those in attendance included colleagues from ABC and police officers who were working on the case. The considerable media attention led to a special area for journalists to observe from while the funeral was taking place. As Jill still had family back in Ireland, the following day a formal memorial mass took place at St. Peter's Church in her hometown of Drogheda, with hundreds attending. The priest who had married her and Tom, Father Oliver Devine, presided over the Massachusetts. The whole town was brought to a standstill as people silently marched through the streets. Her uncle Michael was given countless books of condolence from passersby. At a pre-committal hearing in January 2013, a two-day committal case in the Melbourne Magistrates Court was scheduled to start on March 12, 2013. According to various news reports, Bailey intended to fight the charges against him. However, on April 5, 2013, he entered a plea of guilty to the rape and murder of Jill Ma. 21 days later, he was back in court to answer for several other sexual assaults in Melbourne, dating back to the year 2000. On these charges, he entered a plea of not guilty. Deputy Chief Magistrate Felicity Broughton also granted the defense's application to extend the existing suppression order banning the publication of damaging or potentially prejudicial material about him, with specific reference to the internet. On the 12th of June, Bailey appeared in court for a pre-sentence hearing. During this hearing, victim impact statements were read out from the Marr family and others, including Jill's supervisor from ABC, Catherine Hurley. The devastation caused was immeasurable, and it was also revealed in Catherine's speech that many of Jill's colleagues from work had to seek counseling following her murder. Her widow, Atom, said in a statement, what was stolen from me on September 22, 2012, was love, my best friend, and my entire world. I think of the waste of a brilliant mind and a beautiful soul. I am half a person because of this crime. Her brother, Michael, said, I am in dreadful pain. I must carry on living a full life, yet I will never forget my sister. During this hearing, Bailey's lawyer, Saul Holt QC, said that Bailey understood he deserved a life sentence and that he was remorseful, saying, there is a sense of true remorse and true empathy about what he has done. Part of Bailey's apology was also read out to the court. I'd like to apologize for my actions. That night, I destroyed a precious life and many others. Prosecutors hit back at the claim that he was remorseful, arguing that as he had attempted to conceal the murder, that proved he wasn't sorry for his actions. During the meeting, the suppression order was also lifted by Justice Jeffrey Nettle, which allowed for Bailey's extensive history of rape and violence to be revealed and reported on. The courtroom was packed out and the public gallery was full at the Victoria Supreme Court. Adrian Ernest Bailey was sentenced to life in prison with a non-parole period of 35 years for the rape and murder of Jill Marr. When sentencing him, Justice Nettle said that Adrian Bailey was a sexual deviant, who either killed Jill because she was threatening to call the police after being raped by him, or because the idea of taking her life aroused him. You were larger and stronger than she, and you used that physical advantage to dominate her. In effect, you dragged her off the streets late at night while she was peaceably going about her own business, within a stone's throw of her home. He also explained that had he not entered a plea of guilty, he would have received life in prison without the possibility of parole. Throughout his sentencing, Bailey stared down at the floor, only looking at once as his sentence was handed down. Following the high-profile case, in June 2013, Victoria's parole laws underwent a massive overhaul, directly as a result of the murder of Jill Ma and other women being attacked and or killed by people on parole. Nearly three years earlier, another Melbourne woman, Elsa Corp, was attacked, stabbed and strangled in a South Melbourne motel by a convicted drug trafficker who, like Bailey, was also out on parole. Under the new laws which were introduced in the Victorian Parliament later that week, Breaching parole would now be considered a separate offense. 
A breach of parole could mean breaking a curfew or breaching an alcohol ban. Police could also take formal action if parole was breached and any violent offenders that committed a serious breach of their bail conditions could immediately be returned to prison. The new Premier of Victoria said in June 2013, There is no doubt that the system failed, Jill Mar. Under the changes we've already introduced, the offender would have been back in jail, not on the streets. Our actions are the minimum we can do to try and make sure this never, ever happens again. The changes did not stop there. The High Court Justice Ian Callanan made recommendations to change the parole system. He highlighted 23 areas that required improvement. One such recommendation was that the paper system used to keep track of parolees was replaced by an electronic database. Another was that the part-time parole board be replaced with a full-time one and that prisoners be required to prove they are at low risk of reoffending before they are released on bail. In September that year, it was revealed that Bailey had lodged an appeal against his sentence through the Victorian Legal Aid. The appeal argued that the minimum non-parole period was too long and that he hadn't taken perverted pleasure in murdering Jill, which was what Justice Nettle had said in his sentencing. In September, both the defense and prosecution argued their cases. On the 26th of September, after less than 10 minutes of deliberations, his appeal was dismissed. More controversy arose in November that year, when a senior police sergeant with Victoria at a fundraiser for the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia. During the talk, he showed a photo of Jill's body that had been taken at the crime scene. The detective apologized following an outcry and stated that the photograph had only been briefly displayed and that he had the backing of Jill's family to use it. It also emerged he had done this several times before. The police later apologized, calling the matter an unfortunate error. There was further controversy when a Catholic priest gave a talk at a primary school and he told the children that had Jill been more faith-filled, she would have been at home in bed and not walking down the street at night. He also said that she had been walking at 3 a.m., which was not correct. The Vicar General of the Catholic Archdiocese of Melbourne, Greg Bennett, told the 3 AW radio station that the Catholic Church apologized for the comments made by the priest, saying, the reference to Jill Marr in particular was offensive and inappropriate, and the people of Victoria and Ireland mourn her sad and tragic death. He also spoke to the priest in question who acknowledged the offensiveness of his remarks and also apologized. The suppression order that was in place during his trial had also had far-reaching consequences. Australian TV and radio presenter Darren Hinch was ordered to pay a fine of $100,000 after he had attempted to reveal Bailey's long rap sheet of sexual offenses and rapes. This was in breach of the suppression order. He failed to pay the fine and therefore, on January 17, 2014, the 69-year-old began serving a 50-day prison sentence. Almost two years after he had began his sentence for the rape and murder of Jill Marr, Bailey was found guilty of three more rapes committed before he had killed her. These three trials were all held separately between 2014 and 2015. His victims were two sex workers and a Dutch backpacker. In the case of the backpacker, he had pretended to be a good Samaritan, telling her she was being followed by a car in the bayside suburb of St. Kilda as she walked home from the pub. Believing he was genuine, she accepted his offer of a lift and got into his car. He then drove her to an isolated spot, where he brutally raped her. An e-fit was issued and she was able to identify him from a photo board. The survivors of all three rapes had come forward due to the high level of publicity following Jill's abduction and killing. By that point, he had now been convicted of sexual offenses against 12 different people. The systems of the Victoria Police were, once again, in the firing line. It emerged that Bailey's DNA had been obtained in 2001 after he had sexually assaulted another woman. But this DNA was not being held on the Victoria Police's DNA database. In April that year, the Victorian coroner announced plans to hold an inquest into Jill's death were no longer going to go ahead. Her family welcomed this news, saying all they wanted was closure. The non-profit organization Legacy Australia that helps provide support to servicemen and women and their families who were hurt or killed in action, set up an online condolences book. By July 2015, more than 3,000 people had signed it, many saying they had never even met Jill, but felt compelled to offer their thoughts and prayers. Bailey was sentenced to a further 18 years in custody, meaning his non-parole period was extended from 35 years to 43. The following month, on the 25th of June, 
he lodged an appeal against two out of the three convictions and the extended non-parole period. In the summer of 2016, Bailey lodged yet another appeal against one of his rape convictions and was given a three-year reduction to his sentence. During the court proceedings, Bailey's lawyer explained that following psychological testing, he was not deemed to suffer from psychopathy, but rather he had been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. His borderline personality disorder manifested itself in extreme and severe mood swings, as well as poorly controlled anger. He also said that as a child he had suffered sexual abuse at the hands of an older female relative, as well as physical abuse at the hands of his father. Despite his efforts to reduce his sentence, he will be in his 80s before he can even be considered for parole, and even if that happens, a parole board must be satisfied that he is no longer a danger to the public. In November 2020, Bailey's mother broke her silence to give an interview about her son's case. She explained that prior to Jill's murder, she tried to tell the police that she believed he was dangerous, and that the police had failed to heed her warning and take the appropriate action. Jill's devastated widow, a Tom, left Australia and returned to Ireland in August 2013. In November the following year, he made a trip back to Australia to promote the White Ribbon Campaign, aimed at stopping violence against women. In June 2013, he gave an interview with ABC and explained how he felt the justice system had let his wife down. He also wrote an essay for the White Ribbon website called The Danger of the Monster Myth, tackling the stereotypes that many have about sex offenders. Part of the essay reads, we cannot separate these cases from one another, because doing so allows us to ignore the fact that all these crimes have exactly the same cause. We can only move past violence when we recognize how it is enabled, and by attributing it to the mental illness of a singular human being, we ignore its prevalence, its root causes, and the self-examination required to end the cycle. Male self-examination requires this courage, and we cannot end the pattern of men's violence against women without consciously breaking our silence, although nothing can ever be done to ease the pain that has been caused. Jill's friends and family are determined that her and her impact will never be forgotten. Tom has said that following the death of his wife, the writings of Maya Angelou have been a source of peace and comfort, with the following in particular resonating with him. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Danvers, Massachusetts, is home to approximately 27,000 people. Originally called Salem Village, Danvers has a rich history and is dotted with many landmarks and popular attractions. It is perhaps most famous for its connection to the Salem Witch Trials of 1692, after which the town was later renamed Danvers. This particular case begins in Danvers High School in 2013. 24-year-old Colleen Elizabeth Ritzer had been at Danvers High School for about a year and taught ninth grade algebra. She was born to Tom and Peggy Ritzer and had two younger siblings. They all described her as positive and optimistic, with a big heart and a genuine passion for helping people. Family was everything to Colleen, and people said she cherished every moment she spent with them. Colleen knew from a young age that teaching was what she had to do. Her passion for teaching and learning was infectious, and she often started her classes with inspirational quotes or pictures. She was very active on social media, posting puzzles and games to help her students learn, and people said she would always find time to help anyone struggling with their studies. Many of her students said they didn't even like mathematics until they had Colleen as a teacher, but her unique style, positive outlook, and willingness to help anyone finding things tough meant she quickly proved very popular with students. Tuesday, October 22, 2013. As the school day drew to a close and the building started to empty, Kayleen was finishing up some bits in her room. She left her classroom, A209, and briefly spoke to another teacher in the hallway before heading to the second floor bathroom just before 3 p.m. At 6.30 p.m. that day, a frantic parent filed a missing persons report. Diana Chisholm's 14-year-old son was missing and he attended Danvers High School. Philip Chisholm was a quiet and reserved teen who had recently moved from Tennessee with his mother after his parents' divorce. He excelled in sports but kept to himself where everything else was concerned, and he socialized with few of the other children at his new school. Mike Chase, the coach from Danvers High School, had also received word that Philip hadn't turned up to practice and had missed the team meal too. 
Three hours later at 9 p.m., Danvers High School Principal Sue sent a mass email to all school faculty and staff, informing them that their 14-year-old student was missing. Shortly after this email was sent, another mass teacher called Sarah phoned Sue. Colleen Ritzer's parents had just contacted her to ask if she had seen their daughter, as Colleen appeared to be missing too. Colleen lived with her parents, and they were expecting her home hours ago, but ended up driving home without seeing her. He noted her car was still in its parking spot, but couldn't find her around the school. Tom said he was so proud of her, and all he wanted to do was tell her how exciting it was to see her new classroom. The more time ticked by, the more everyone was starting to worry for both the missing teacher and students. Danvers High School had been shut for ages, and there would be no reason for either of them to still be there. The teacher Sarah also informed Sue that Philip had actually been in Colleen's last class that day, and it seemed too coincidental that they were now both missing at the same time. Sue and a few other teachers went to the school to look for the pair, but they couldn't see them anywhere. Colleen's classroom seemed to be just as she'd left it, but they noted all her belongings were missing, and her car was still in its spot. At 11.20 p.m., with still no word from their daughter, the anxious Ritzers officially reported Colleen's missing to the Danvers police. Detectives quickly had her cell phone provider ping the location of her phone, and her phone's last known location was around 24 minutes away on foot from Danvers High School. They also pinged Philip's phone. His phone, however, was traced to a nearby cinema, Hollywood Hits Theater, but when the police arrived, he was no longer there. Searches were now underway in and around the school, and to everyone's concern, Colleen's purse was soon found in the surrounding area. It was empty and her cards and ID were gone. A search of the school found red-brown stains on the second-floor bathroom. At 12.30 a.m. on what was now October 23rd, police were notified that a pedestrian was walking alone in the southbound lane on Route 1, north at Salem Lane in Topsfield. Topsfield police soon realized it was the missing Philip Chisholm. The 14-year-old was patted down and police found a knife on him. Following this, they took him to Topsfield Police Station, where his backpack was searched. It was here that officers found a bloodied box cutter, Colleen's credit cards and driver's license. They also found underwear, which would later be confirmed to be Colleen's too. Philip told officers he innocently found all the items lying around at a stop and shop and just decided to pick them up. He then said he stole them from a car. So where did the blood on the box cutter come from? Officers asked. The girl, he finally said. He calmly told police that the woman was in the woods and was beyond help. Philip was then taken to Danvers Police Station where he later met with his mother. It was noted that his demeanor then quickly changed and he asked to talk to officers without his mother present. He was placed under arrest. While Philip was being interviewed, at around 3 a.m. a couple of hours later, a devastating discovery was made. Kaliam Ritz's body was found near the school in the wooded area. She had been stabbed, strangled, and raped. She was naked from the waist down, and her top had been pulled up and her bra pulled down. Next to her body was a handwritten note saying, I hate you all. She was posed in what was referred to by police as a sexually suggestive position, and had been violated with a tree branch which was still inside her. About 20 yards from her body was a large recycling bin, some bloody gloves and clothing. But what had happened that led to this? The school and surrounding area had over 100 security cameras and police began the painstaking task of analyzing all of them. The footage on them would soon reveal a horrific and disturbing series of events. Another student in Colleen's last class that day recalled that after the lesson had finished, she saw Philip and Colleen talking. Colleen had spotted Philip drawing during the class and asked him to stay a little later to help him do some more prep for an upcoming test. The student said that while Colleen and Philip were chatting, she mentioned Tennessee in a passing comment, the state that Philip had left a few months before. At the mention of this, he became visibly upset and started muttering to himself. As soon as Colleen noticed this, she quickly changed the subject, but it didn't seem to make a difference. Shortly after the pair finished talking, Colleen left the classroom heading for the second floor bathroom. A minute later, Philip Chisholm started to follow her. He then strangled her, stabbed her 16 times with a box cutter, and raped her. At 3.06 p.m., 
a female student entered the same bathroom. She told investigators she saw the back of a person who appeared to be changing. The person's rear was exposed, and the clothes were piled on the floor. Not wanting to disturb whoever it was she thought was changing, she quickly turned and left. Philip then left the bathroom. Over the next few minutes, he ran in and out of the school building, eventually returning to the classroom and fetching his and some of Colleen's belongings. He put on a black ski mask before bumping into another student and taking the mask off. At 3.14, he pulled a recycling bin into the bathroom and put Colleen inside it. He put his black ski mask back on and pulled the bin into a lift before dragging it out towards the student parking lot. When he got Colleen into the woods using the bin, he sexually assaulted her with a three-foot-long tree branch before leaving her body on the ground, partially clothed, covered in sticks and leaves. At 3.30 p.m., the mother of another student saw Philip running near the school. She relayed this information to the principal at about 6 p.m. that day. Around the same time Diana had reported him missing, Philip then returned to the building about half an hour later, with blood on his jeans and without his shoes. He changed his clothes, heading back into the second floor bathroom one more time, and stayed on site for a while longer, skipping his after-school sports practice. He then left the building completely. He went straight to the cinema and purchased a ticket for a 4.30 p.m. film showing. He left at around 6 p.m. and then used Colleen's credit cards at a nearby Wendy's. Near the cinema, police later found both Philip and Colleen's smashed phones, indicating that Philip had destroyed Colleen's phone near the school surroundings, which is why her phone's last known location was there. The pathologist said there were two causes of death, asphyxiation and the 16 stab wounds to the neck, three of which hit major blood vessels. They said it was not possible to say which killed her. But the pathologist said that she believed the asphyxiation happened first, because the knife wounds to the neck were so severe, it would have been too difficult to strangle her after stabbing her. Medical examiners believe Colleen was likely still alive when Philip dragged her body into the woods behind the school and subjected her to the horrific sexual assault with the tree branch. A professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School said cases such as these were off the charts rare. I personally have never seen anything like this in the hundreds of cases I've had and the thousands of cases I've supervised, he said. Despite the overwhelming amount of evidence, including Philip's partial admission, he pled not guilty. In Massachusetts, anyone 14 years old or above who is charged with murder is automatically tried as an adult. Philip was tried as an adult on the murder charge and as a youth offender on the charges of armed robbery and aggravated rape. Philip attacked a youth services worker. He followed her into a locker room, where he choked and beat her before other workers intervened. The worker suffered injuries to her face, jaw, neck, and back, and Chisholm then faced further charges and a separate trial for attempted murder in this case. His trial in Kayleen Ritz's case, however, began in 2015. Philip's lawyers did not dispute Philip killing Kayleen, but argued that it happened during a psychotic episode that had been triggered by Kayleen mentioning the word Tennessee to him. On this basis, they asked for the jury to find him not guilty by reason of insanity. Defense attorney Denise Reagan said that Philip's family also had a history of mental health issues and that he likely suffered from them too from an early age. A psychiatrist that testified for the defense also said that Philip probably has early onset. They said that it was obvious that Philip had planned the attack in advance, as he already brought a ski mask, gloves, and a box cutter to school that day, and this was not a psychotic break based on the conversation they had in the classroom. Philip's defense lawyers also fought hard for him to be acquitted of the sexual assault in the woods. They disagreed with medical examiners, saying that they thought Colleen had already died by the time the assault with the tree branch happened meaning that Philip should be acquitted of that part of the crime on that basis alone. Life sentences without parole for juveniles have been found to be unconstitutional in Massachusetts, and under separate decisions made by the U.S. Supreme Court and the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, Philip could not be sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for murder. Ultimately, the jury rejected the insanity defense that Philip Chisholm's lawyers had put forward and found him guilty, because the judge also imposed concurrent sentences of 40 years for rape, and 40 years for armed robbery. This means he will not actually be able to apply for parole until he is in his 50s. Philip was however acquitted of the second count of rape committed using the tree branch in the woods. During the 10 hours of deliberations, 
This was the only question juries had and had to ask the judge to clarify this. Defense attorneys argued that Kaleem was dead when she was in the woods and when Chisholm violated her with the branch. A medical examiner that she had died by this point. Jurors ultimately believed she was no longer alive at this point, and Massachusetts law requires a live victim to convict someone of rape. Unlike other states, Massachusetts doesn't have a law against abuse of a corpse. Philip Chisholm was placed in a state juvenile detention facility and will stay there until he turns 21. He will then be sent to a state prison. Philip's mother reached out to the Ritzer family and said, the words can't express the amount of pain and sorrow these past two and a half years have been. However, there is no one who has suffered more than the Ritzer family. My utmost esteem, prayers and humble respect is with them today as they continue their journey to heal. Tom Ritzer said, it makes me sick to know that I walked the same halls as her killer. It makes me sick to know I drove by her in the woods and drove home. A dad's job is to protect his family. I didn't protect Colleen. A dad's job is to fix things. I can't fix this. Peggy said she often has to stay isolated from people because pretending to be happy is so difficult. Colleen Ritzer loved nothing more than inspiring and supporting people, teaching them and helping them to learn and grow. The difference Colleen made to so many people's lives was clear by the outpouring of heartfelt messages following her passing. Over 1,000 people turned out to pay their respects at Colleen's funeral, and hundreds of students and teachers participated in numerous vigils and other community events to celebrate her life. Her family established the Colleen E. Ritza Memorial Scholarship in her honor, which since October 2013 has awarded over $370,000 in college scholarships to 82 future teachers. One of Colleen's friends also started the Kindness for Colleen campaign. This encourages everyone to perform random acts of kindness on October 22nd each year and share them on social media. A beautiful and fitting tribute for the kind, positive, and compassionate Colleen Ritza. Paul Krashik served in the United States Army from 1966 to 1974, with his experiences during the Vietnam War shaping his perspective. When his daughter Darlene expressed interest in joining the Army after graduating high school in 1985, Paul strongly discouraged her from following his path. His wife Betty Lou shared these concerns for Darlene's safety and also urged her not to enlist. Despite their advice, Darlene remained resolute and determined to pursue her plans. In 1987, she joined the Army and was stationed at Fort Carson in Colorado. She had achieved the rank of specialist and was assigned to the 73rd Maintenance Company. On March 16, 1987, 20-year-old Darlene and several other members of her unit went out to Shuffles, a club on South Academy Boulevard in Colorado Springs that was popular with soldiers from Fort Carson. The group spent the evening dancing and having a few drinks together. Because they had work the next morning, most of the group went home early that night, but Darlene stayed later than the rest of her friends. The last known sighting of Darlene was sometime between midnight and 1 a.m. when a witness saw her leave the club. At approximately 5.20 that morning, March 17, 1987, two police officers were conducting early morning business checks. Near the dumpster in the alley behind the Korean club restaurant, they discovered a woman's body. The woman was nude, save for her gray pants, which were pulled down to her ankles and one sock. She had a black rope around her neck and a wire hanger around her head. The officers found a driver's license nearby and it identified the woman as Darlene Krashik. The location where she was found was on the same road as Shuffles. Approximately a mile south of it, authorities did not believe that the alley was the site of the crime. Rather, they believed that Darlene's body had just been left there. Darlene had been severely beaten but her autopsy would show that she had died as a result of strangulation. She had also been sexually assaulted. According to those who knew Darlene, she had a heart of gold and was willing to provide help to anyone who needed it. No one could provide investigators with leads about anyone who would have wanted to hurt her or any potential motives for her murder. She was well-liked in her community and had a close group of friends, but no known enemies. She had not gotten into any sort of argument or altercation with anyone at the club the last night she was alive that could have escalated into violence. Army CID and the Colorado Springs Police Department interviewed hundreds of people, both soldiers and civilians, 
They identified a handful of persons of interest, but were unable to make any arrests, and the case ultimately went cold. While they were unable to pinpoint an exact motive for the crime, investigators did speculate, based on the last phone conversation Darlene had with her mother, that her death may have had something to do with the army. Just weeks before her death, Darlene was excited about her future in the army and the opportunities it was providing for her future. However, when she spoke to her mother on the phone a week before her murder, Darlene was upset about something that was going on at Fort Carson and wanted to get away from the installation. She told her mother that she could not explain to her why she was so upset at that time. The Krashik family worked hard on their own investigation into Darlene's case and on keeping her story in the public eye. In 1996, they came to Colorado Springs to distribute flyers asking for information in Darlene's voice. I was only 20 years old. They took my dignity, my pride, and my jacket. Then, without mercy, they took my life. If you know something and think it's insignificant, you're mistaken. It's probably the missing link. Betty Lou and Paul Krashik investigated similar crimes from all over the world, filling up their home office with files and newspaper clippings. As the original investigators retired or were reassigned, the couple would call their replacements to make sure that they knew about their daughter and were working on her case. They kept Darlene's picture with them in their Bible. Darlene's case was reopened several times in hopes that new technology would finally identify her killer. In 2004, DNA from an unknown male was identified on several pieces of evidence and on several areas of Darlene's body. Originally, only a partial DNA profile was identified from this evidence, but in 2016, a much stronger profile was isolated. Unfortunately, no match to this profile was found in local or federal databases. That same year, the DNA evidence was submitted to two different laboratories for further, it was sent to the United States Army Criminal Investigation Laboratory for YSTR analysis, which focuses specifically on the Y chromosome. The evidence was also sent to Parabon Nanolabs that December. Parabon used their snapshot DNA phenotyping program to create an image of what the contributor of the DNA may have looked like at the time of the murder, and in 2016, based on his DNA. They had no way of knowing the perpetrator's actual age, so they had to assign one. The images were generated to show the unknown male in his mid-twenties, as he may have been in 1987, and in his mid-fifties, as he may have been at the time the images were created. These images were released to the public in March of 2017, but despite the offer of a $10,000 reward from the army, no one came forward, correctly identifying the man in the images. In early 2019, Army CID and the Colorado Springs Police Department asked Parabon to submit the DNA profile to GED Match, an online genetic genealogy database, and try to use genetic genealogy to identify their suspect. Using this method, Parabon was able to identify several distant relatives of the individual who had left his DNA at the scene. The closest relatives were a woman and her daughter living in Wisconsin, and another woman living in Texas. These women were believed to have a 6th to 9th degree relationship to the contributor of the DNA profile being investigated, meaning they could be as closely related as second cousins once removed, or as distantly related as fourth cousins. By constructing the family trees of the relatives found in the GED Match database and comparing them, Parabon was able to narrow down what branch of their family they shared with the unknown male. Pirobon was then able to identify a potential suspect found in all of their family trees who would have shared the same amount of DNA as the person with a DNA profile from the crime scene. That suspect was 58-year-old Michael David White. White had served in the Army from October of 1979 until April of 1998. Working as a he had been stationed at Fort Carson from September of 1986 until August of 1987. After leaving the Army, White went to work for CenturyLink. He worked there for the next two decades, and eventually he rose to the position of senior network engineer. In 2019, he was living in Thornton, Colorado, just north of Denver, with his wife. He had no criminal record. On May 20th, 2019, two detectives went to White's residence and saw him get into his car. They then followed him to work. Later that day, they followed him as he left work on his lunch break and went to a nearby fast food restaurant. There, they watched him drink from a cup as he ate his meal. When White left the restaurant, leaving the cup behind, 
The two detectives collected it in hopes that a DNA sample could be taken from it. They also surreptitiously swabbed the door handle of White's car as another potential source of his DNA. Testing showed that Michael White's DNA matched that found at the crime scene. On June 13, 2019, 32 years after Darlene Krashik's murder, he was arrested at his home and taken into custody on a no-bond warrant. He is being charged with first-degree murder after deliberation, first-degree felony murder, and aggravated first-degree sexual assault. White's wife told local reporters that her husband is innocent of the charges against him and that their entire family is shocked by his arrest. Darlene's parents traveled to Colorado from their home in West Virginia to attend Michael White's first appearance in court shortly after his arrest. The appearance was only about five minutes long, but the trip was still worth it for the crash OX. They returned to Colorado for a preliminary hearing in the case on October 25th. Paul and Betty Lou have pledged to make the trip to Colorado for every one of Michael White's court appearances. The Crash OX are hoping that, after 32 years of freedom, White will live long enough to serve 32 years in prison. He had his probation, now it's time to do his time, Paul told Fox 21 News. I would just tell him that I feel sorry for his mother, Betty Lou said in the same interview. He took my life away from me when he took Darlene, so I can only imagine what his mother feels knowing what he did. Michael White is currently being held at the Criminal Justice Center in Colorado Springs, and his next court appearance is scheduled for February 18th, 2020. Thank you for joining us on this journey into the depths of unsolved mysteries. Cold cases not only challenge our understanding of the past, but also ignite our curiosity and determination for answers. Remember to subscribe to stay updated on our latest investigations. And if you have any information regarding the cases we've covered, don't hesitate to reach out. Together, we can shed light on the shadows of the past and bring closure to those who seek it. Until next time, stay vigilant, stay curious, and never stop seeking the truth.